the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's with these lines that the gospel of St. Mark, according to most scholars, the earliest of the gospels written. This is how it begins. And it is the first line, and so we are tempted to go right over it and get into the meat of things, understandably. But there's tons of stuff packed into this one little sentence. The beginning. Now that's the first word in the whole Bible. The book of Genesis. In the beginning. Bereshit bera Elohim hashamayim ha'eretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And St. John, starting his gospel, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So St. Mark here, by using this word, is hearkening back to the creation of things and is proposing that now we have a recreation, a new creation, a renewal of humanity and of everything that exists. It's the beginning of what? Of the gospel. A word that we are so used to hearing, a word that most of us know means good news. It's from the old English version of that phrase, God spell, good news. From the Greek evangelion, from where we get evangelist and evangelize and so on. But in its original secular context, an evangelion was a proclamation given all around the country when a king or an emperor had won in battle. It was a proclamation of victory. That was the good news, that the king has won. And so the Evangelion, the gospel, is a proclamation of victory that is being proclaimed right here. And a proclamation of victory of whom? Of Jesus. Jesus is a Greek form of the word Jesus, of the Hebrew word Yeshua, which means God saves. Joshua. There's an English anglicized version of that name. And in the Bible, after the people have reached the promised land, they have gone through the sojourn of 40 years in the desert led by Moses. It is Joshua, the son of Nun, who leads the tribes of Israel into the conquest of the promised land to receive the inheritance that God has promised them. And this Joshua is the same who is going to lead his people God's chosen people into the promised land that will last forever. So it is the beginning of the victory proclamation of Joshua, the leader of God's people. And Christ, Christ is not a surname as we know. It's not Mary Christ and Joseph Christ and so on. Christ is a title. It's again a Greek word, Christos, of the title Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah, which means God's anointed one. The one on whom oil has been poured as a sign of God's election and choosing. In the Bible, preeminently the anointed ones were the kings and the priests, but also the ki- especially the kings and especially David. David is held up as the model king, the one who unified the tribes of Israel and who governed justly. And the scriptures promise that the one who comes again to fulfill God's promises will be in the line of David, will be a king like David of his house. And so we have this Christos, this Mashiach, this anointed one, who is, which is the title of this man, Jesus, Joshua. And then we have this phrase, the son of God, which again, we are tempted to glide right over. Jesus is the son of God. We acknowledge that every week in the creed, we have been inculcated and trained to believe that. And we do believe it. We don't realize just how radical this phrase is. The son of God is used by the Hebrew scriptures, by the Bible to refer to Israel. It refers to the kings in this way. But in the secular world, this title, the son of God, was starting to be used by the Roman emperors for the cult of their own divinity. Rome was a republic for a long time, but now you have the rise of the emperors. And like any good ruler wants God on their side, he says, it's even better if I make myself God and have everyone worship me. So after they died, they were called a son of the God and they were worshiped. In fact, many Christians refused to do this in later years and were martyred. And so St. Mark is saying, here we have not the Roman emperor, but the son of the true and living God, Jesus the Christ. 
Tradition tells us that St. Mark was a companion, a disciple of St. Peter, and that he wrote this gospel in Rome. In fact, if you go to Rome, you go to Piazza Venezia, there is a little church there, the Church of St. Mark, and it is built, according to tradition, on the house where St. Mark composed this gospel. And right there in Rome, in the heart of the empire, in the heart of the empire that claims all power over all things, St. Mark writes these words, these provocative, challenging, subversive words, that here we have the victory proclamation of the king who is recreating all things, the one who is going to lead his people to the promised land of eternal life, the one who is the son of God the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And what is this victory? It is not a victory, an earthly battle of getting more, um, more troops or more land or more treasure. It is a victory especially against the enemy that, has, that mankind has battled from the very beginning. The victory over sin and the fruit of sin, the wages of sin, the last enemy, death. That death which every tyrant and ruler and emperor and government has used by, as, as a way of threat, as a way of ruling, as a way of exerting his own power, that, that enemy is now destroyed in that glorious resurrection of the Son of God. And so we have this victory proclamation and all of us Christians down the age are the ones who have heard this who have believed it and who have united ourselves to following this great leader as he leads his people in every generation out of darkness, out of enmity, out of slavery into eternal life. The early Christians were very, very conscious of the great power of the resurrection, of the new reality that had come in, this new opening, this new horizon or dimension for humanity. It wasn't just the same thing over and over again. There is a new way of being human now, and that involves living the life of the kingdom that Jesus is proclaiming, that he is bringing, that he is the first fruits of. One where death does not reign, where there is no fear, where God's promises have already started appearing in this world. That is why the early Christians, so conscious of the resurrection, could say that we await a new heavens and a new earth, the new Jerusalem that's going to come down. And we pray for the coming of God's kingdom every time we say the Lord's Prayer. We say, thy kingdom come. We wait in expectation with great hope for the full revelation of that kingdom where death is finally destroyed and every tear is wiped away. That's what we say when we pray the Our Father. That is what this season of Advent especially gives us again, that expectation and hope for God's promises to take root, for God's kingdom to come first in over this land, this territory, this mysterious realm that is our own self, our bodies and our souls, and then all around in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our society and country and in the world. Prepare the way of the Lord, John the Baptist says, to the people who are journeying and hastening to meet the coming king. Prepare the way of the Lord, quoting the prophet Isaiah. Get root, get rid of everything in your hearts, in your lives, that is opposed to the kingdom of God. Bad habits, sin, complacency, routine. Prepare, because the kingdom is coming. The Lord is coming. We're going to celebrate his first coming again in a few weeks, looking forward always to his second coming and always conscious of that great coming of his in grace every day in so many mysterious ways, especially most preeminently on this altar where his sacrifice, where his death and resurrection are made present again. Prepare the way of the Lord. Last week I invited um, all, of, all of those who were at the masses that I preached to read again the Gospel of Mark during this Advent. Pick it up, it's the shortest Gospel, 16 chapters, spend time prayerfully reading it, really focusing on the person of Jesus, who he is, what does he want, how does he behave. Let us learn who this person is in a new way. And I also invited everyone for at least this season of Advent, those who have the habit of leaving Mass early, and I have no idea where that was taught to people, 
Stay for Mass. Stay and receive the blessing. We're not here just to get this magical little piece of bread. And if that were the case, we would send up a vending machine. You put your envelope in, pops out, and you can go out. You can have a drive through Get rid of all this rigmarole. We're here to worship God, and there's nothing that is more important. And if we are going to take this seriously, that the king is coming, then it's not just about fulfilling some kind of obligation that is somehow in our cultural DNA because of grandma or something, and then get out of here before the parking lot gets too crazy. We are here to give of ourselves fully, offer it on this altar, and receive this great gift so that we can go out and proclaim this good news, that there is a new way of being human, a new way of living and of loving. Prepare the way of the Lord. Let us be renewed again with this proclamation of the victory of the Son of God. The beginning, the recreation of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. May he be praised forever and ever. Amen.